Welcome to this lecture of Studium General of the TU Delft. I'm your host, Klaas van der Tempel. Uh, this is going to be an introduction lecture to a series that we're calling Decolonizing Knowledge. Now, we've probably all seen images of statues being pulled down, museums being challenged, and even challenges uh, in politics for changes to the education curriculum. Decolonization is all of this and more. It's a broad academic and social movement that's made all the more relevant by the Black Lives Matter movement, the protests around the world. And so we'd like to devote a program to this today, um, introducing us in Delft to decoloniality. So with us today is Dr. Rolando Vasquez, who is an associate professor at the uh, University College of Roosevelt and the University College of Utrecht, and also the co-founder of the Decolonial Summer School. And thirdly, with us in the studio, you can't see her yet, is Annelin Machielsen. She's an industrial ecology student sitting to our left uh, because of the corona uh, restrictions, but she'll be joining us in a minute to ask Rolando questions as well. What is decolonization? Where does it come from and why is it important? There have even been calls from students and staff here at the University of Delft to decolonize the TU Delft. Why? And why is it important? Thank you, Klaas. Thank you, Annelien. Um, I think it is, a, it is a very important moment we are living today uh, where we see the struggles against first sexism in the Netherlands with feminism, but then being intersected by the struggles on racism that have completely changed also the nature of the feminist struggles. And it is a moment in which these struggles uh, are joined by the colonial thought or the colonial awareness. So they are not just in an ideological position against the status quo of society, but they are encountering a growing decolonial scholarship that um, that is showing that the fight against sexism and racism is a fight that needs broader transformations. And this is where uh, decolonial critique becomes very important. The need of transforming knowledge, the need of transforming the ways we govern our institutions, the way, uh, the way um, our institutions institutions are inclusive or not inclusive. So I think it is a really important junction between social movements and scholarship that is happening and that is producing this, uh, let's call it a decolonial moment. Is, you, is there a, a strong activist movement at the university or is it really an academic issue? Well, I think uh, first of all, I think uh, the decolonial awareness is coming through activism. So, for example, uh, the protests at the University of Amsterdam a few years ago were demanding the decolonization of the university. And at that moment, the university was asking itself, well, what does that mean? Because people higher up in the university had no idea what decoloniality meant. And I think this conversation is still in that line of uh, trying to explain what the struggles are about, because these are struggles that don't fall easily in the old political panorama between left and right. The call for decoloniality is something different. So I would say in the University of Amsterdam, when we did the Let's Do Diversity report uh, with Professor Gloria Becker, uh, we um, we show that decolonizing or decoloniality is not about just the political decolonization, the historical decolonization. Let's say that there is no any more colonies. That's not the point of decoloniality, mm. right? So decoloniality is about transforming our uh, institutions and our ways of doing things in different levels. So we. We can call it a multi-level approach, especially for the universities, but also for other institutions like the museums. And we, we suggested three key questions to, to reveal these three levels. 
So the question of the who, that is referring to who is at the university, who is in the classroom, do we have a classroom that really represents the diversity of society or just an international classroom that is not necessarily diverse, for example. And, but also who is managing the university, right? Who are the deans in terms of race and gender? But also who is cleaning and who is cooking and who is in the security services of the university? And then you will see, I always tell this to my students, right? Uh, you see in the university, when you look who is at the top and who is doing the services, you immediately see the colonial structure of society that we just normalize. Mm. For us, it's normal that uh, racialized women are in the cooking services and the catering services, and that the white males of the university are the deans, right? So this is the question. Why do we have that picture of society? Obviously, it has a long history, but this is a history that we are beginning to question today. Um, then next to the who, the other level we thought we need to approach is the what. Right? So what we teach, what we research, what the university produces, what the museum displays and collects. Right? And this what uh, has to do very strongly in the university with the transformation of the canon. Right? The transformation of the canon of education where uh, most disciplines are monoculture. What do you mean monoculture? So by monocultural we mean that they are uh, that they come from a single local history that is the local history of Europe, the history of the West. So this is what in the coloniality we say a local history that became a global design. This is uh, one of the phrases of Walter Mignolo. Um, so the local history of Europe became the global design for the world. And then its local history uh, became the source of all disciplines, for example, in the university. So, uh, you know, the banner in the student struggles in the UK, in South Africa, is why my curriculum is white. Because if you look at what you have read since you are a uh, kid in the kindergarten <laughs> to what you are reading in your PhD, and you look at who is writing, who are you reading, with whose eyes are you been taught to see the world, then you discover that there is just a single historical subject that controls knowledge, or what we call the canon, right? And these prim primarily white males, because they have been favored historically by a combination of a patriarchal or sexist structure and a racist structure. And that's why the white males, it doesn't mean that their work is not important, their work is very important. So we are not denying that that science is science or that that knowledge is knowledge. We are showing the positionality of that knowledge, who has done that knowledge, and why the other people in the world is not producing that knowledge or is not being read or is not being studied. Mm -hmm. And that's where the colonial difference appears when you begin asking these questions, right? Maybe we have a lot to learn from the philosophies of First Nations or indigenous people around the world on how to relate to the earth, for example. But we, because of the colonial structures, we never took seriously their knowledge as science. The, that's not science, that's mythology, and that's the colonial difference again. Mm -hmm. Some people have science and the others have mythology or beliefs, right? But when their beliefs have preserved the few uh, remaining spaces in the world where nature has been preserved are run by those beliefs. So maybe those beliefs have a lot to tell us about, um, about how to uh, have a viable civilization to, in this planet, for example. So, okay, I've spoken about the who, the what, and the third question we raise is the how, mm. right? And the how is the practices, so how we do things. It's not just about changing the canon, because you can change the canon and let's say teach, uh, uh, let's call it indigenous sustainability or ecology, and still teach it in a racist way, right? So you really need to change the pedagogies, the ways of doing it. 
the pedagogy? What do you mean? Yes, the ways of doing, the ways of teaching in the teaching? classroom, and the ways of going about things, right? Now, um, maybe it will be for the following talk, but the, the other key question that comes here is the why. We think that students of science, of technology, like in this university, should know why they are studying what they are studying. It's, it's not just studying science for science sake. What is this for, right? For whom? Is this to increase the extractive industry, the mining industry, the oil industry, the carbon economy? What is this knowledge for? So it's not, knowledge in itself is not just good. You have to put it for a good cause. And that's the question that I think should be central in also uh, technical universities or in engineering. Why are we learning this? What is it for? Mm -hmm. Is it to exploit more the earth or is it to preserve the earth? Right? Is it to control the world of others or is it to include the world of others? And, and science can work for both. Science needs the question of why and for whom, right? Why I'm studying this. So if um, maybe in the last five minutes I can talk a little bit about the pedagogies that you were asking me about. And um, so, so the pedagogies mean how we go about things, how we practice things, right? And so these are tools for, uh, for doing decoloniality, if you want, in practice. And here, for example, we speak of the pedagogies of positionality, uh, relationality, and transition. I will explain. That. Those are big words. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, part of, the, of our work is to, to reach, uh, to produce vocabulary that enables us to do things differently well, and not to fall back in the same vocabulary. So that's why we are putting these big words, but I will explain them. When you say we, who do you mean? Yeah, I mean, when we speak, uh, when we speak about the we or through the we, it's a way of um, it's a way of acknowledging that what I am saying here now is not just what I thought, but mm. it comes from a collective effort of a lot of people that have been in the work of decoloniality. So, what I'm saying is a we in that sense okay. that includes uh, feminist scholarship, especially non-white feminisms, black scholarship, Chicano scholarship the colonial scholarship, and that's why I often use the we. I know it's often misunderstood as a sort of royal we, like no, wanting I mean. to think for <laughs> others, but it's the reverse. Is why I will say I if, right. if I'm only thinking this because there are many people that have been in the conversation, mm. right? So, it, so that's why it's a way of uh, speaking more communally about our ideas. Okay. So thank you for asking that. Uh, I, I will just briefly explain the, the pedagogies and maybe we can open the questions. And Certainly. Yeah. So, um, so when we speak of pedagogies of positionality, it's about acknowledging that knowledge is from someone and from somewhere. Often in, in the tradition of Western objectivity, Knowledge is just universal and abstract, and it's for everybody the same. But we a think... A good idea is a, is a good idea for everybody. Yes. But we think that, or yeah, whatever discipline it is, true for everybody everywhere, mm -hmm. right? But we think that a more truthful knowledge is a position knowledge. So to acknowledge where it comes from, from his historical moment, who is speaking? What is it for? Because all knowledge is situated historically and socially. Mm. And that gives it much more validity when it is recognized where it comes from. So when people say, well, how can we decolonize mathematics or physics? Or, Well, you position the canon, you know? The fact that the canon is all these males is because in that historical period, 
These were the people at Texas University that had the privilege of having education, et cetera, et cetera, right? That were under a colonial structure that could feed them and they didn't need to work for their food, for example. And so positioning the canon is to say, yes, this is truthful knowledge, but it belongs to this historical moment, you know? And that, that makes it more truthful for us. And, and it also shows that it is not all the knowledge that there is, that there is other knowledges that might not be produced by that historical moment and by that person, right? So, so it is what we call it is uh, positionality is something that helps us towards what we call humbling. Instead of the arrogance of a universal knowledge that I know everything for everybody in the world, is no, I know this that comes from this particular history, mm. and that uh, is in this location of power, and that puts me in a humble position from which I can listen to others, right? And not assume I am the only one in the know, right? Uh, the second, uh, so this is why I, I call it, and we call it pedagogies, that is a moment of uh, how we practice this knowledge. You can practice this knowledge saying it's universal and it's the truth, or you can practice this knowledge saying, is a very valid knowledge that comes from this location, right? And we think the second is the possibility of moving towards inclusion and plurality. Then, um, so one last thing, positionality is not relativity. We are not saying every knowledge goes. We are saying every knowledge is located and it is uh, valuable in relation to its location, right? To its position. So extractive knowledge for the oil industry is valuable, but it's valuable for some people, right? Mm. But it's very damaging for other people, <laughs> for example. So you position the knowledge, right? What is this for? And where it comes from? Then uh, the second uh, moment of the, let's say the practice, is a moment of that we have called relationality. And, and relationality has to do with moving towards a knowledge with, that puts a lot of importance in listening. So, and, and listening is something that we are not trained in in the West because we are trained to be the ones who know and who speak. But when you have been humbled and you know that your knowledge is partial because it is located, you know you have the task to listen because there might be other knowledges out there that you need to listen to and that are beyond your framework of understanding. So listening is the possibility of going beyond your small local history. Can, can you say how? how? How do you go beyond your own bubble? Well, you position yourself, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you recognize first that you are in a bubble, <laughs> right. right? Because you recognize, okay, I've read many books, but they all come from a single location, mm. from a single language in the world, for example, right? And they are all they are all in this canon. And then you recognize, okay, I need to listen. I need to listen to things that are beyond what I um, what I already. No, and I was told that that was the universe of knowledge. So, for example, um, uh, we think, and, and the coloniality has been an effort in that exercise of listening, because a lot of what we are saying, let's say more philosophically and in English and for the West, comes from listening to indigenous or First Nations struggles, you know, that they have said. Well, we, we need to work toward a communal world. We need to go beyond an anthropocentric civilization, a civilization that puts the human over the earth mm. because they cannot think like that. They think how absurd it is, some of them say in their philosophies, how absurd it is that we are made to think that to progress is, is to consume more the earth. The more you consume the earth, the more you can extract from the earth, the more progress you have, mm. right? That's the logic of extraction, of the mining industry, of the oil industry. And, and for them it's absurd. 
in their philosophy is totally absurd because they know we all come from the earth. And that's not a mythology. Like all our body is the earth, mm -hmm. you know. There is no single cell in our body that doesn't come from the earth, right? And then we should care for the earth, right? Because it has been handed down to us and we will be handing it down. And that's an idea of good life or if you want development that is antithetical to the idea of progress through the more you can extract from the earth, the more money you have, you know? So that's a way of listening, right? So why am I doing this furthering the extraction more and more and thinking that's leading us to progress? If I listen to this philosophy seriously, I might think twice about it, right? Mm. And I might realize that I'm not going towards progress. I'm destroying the possibility of life, right? So that's an example of, uh, of listening beyond the framework of understanding, right? And uh, I think, for example, also Vandana Shiva has said, uh, how comes that a, a death tree that is wood values, it has more value in money than a forest that is alive, mm -hmm. right? So this type of logic, right? But obviously we have a lot of technology to kill the forest. So what happens when we invest our technology to preserve the forest? That would be different, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the third moment of these uh, practices, so positioning towards humbling, relationality towards listening, and uh, what we call transition or re-existence. Right, so sorry again. Transition. Yeah. So, uh, how do we go beyond the critique of the system? Beyond, okay, capitalism is destroying the world, uh, racism is unjust or unjust, and how do we go beyond it? What is the the proposal, right? And that's the transition. I think Arturo Escobar speaks of transitions towards the pluriverse. So going from a universal model of civilization to a pluriversal, or how the Zapatistas speak of a world where many worlds can fit, right? So we think that our knowledge and the knowledge practices in the universities have to go towards transition, towards really overcoming, not just ending in the critique of modernity, coloniality, but moving towards decoloniality, which is uh, a moment of producing an alternative uh, reality, alternative social relations, alternative histories that have not been able to exist under the conditions of modernity coloniality. So, so the practices are uh, connected to, to the basic ideas of the decolonial framework, that is modernity coloniality. So there has in the in the civilization of the West, there has not been any modernity without coloniality, without the destruction of the earth and of people's lives. So there is no growth of global capitalism without the history of a slavery and racism. Uh, and decoloniality is the moment of delinking from that logic. So of going beyond the system that is a modern colonial system. So when we speak of decoloniality, we are speaking of going beyond that uh, historical configuration of modernity coloniality. And that's why uh, decoloniality is different from Western critique, that often Western critique is, uh, stays at the moment of the critique of the system and might end up in uh, positions of... Um, uh, relativism or nihilism, because there is no outside of that logic of modernity. It is going wrong, but there is no outside. And the coloniality says, no, yes, there is an outside, but you have never listened to it, mm. right? So we need to humble modernity, that's the task of the critique, to decolonize, to go outside that logic. Thank you. That sounds like, uh, on the one hand, on the, on the social scale, we need massive cultural change, but also on the individual level, the, the humbling you spoke about and uh, like a lot of self-reflection to understand where you are, the context of your knowledge and the, and the consequences. So I'm, I'm curious, do you have any idea, let's say 
decoloniality uh, or decolonization becomes uh, really a, so, a, a, an embraced social movement. What's the world going to look like if it succeeds? And what will it look like if it doesn't? <laughs> yes. Um, I think it is not a social movement, but it's a conjunction of multiple social movements, mm. right? And it is very important that it is a framework of thought that is connected to social movements. So it is not just produced in the academia. What we are doing in the academia is to translate it and to put, as you say, big words into it, <laughs> right? <laughs> because we need to also lead uh, what uh, the Sousa Santos called the epistemic struggle. We need to lead a struggle against the structures of knowledge so that these social struggles can be heard. Right. So that is, uh, and you are right that it also implies an individual transformation or or rather something a bit more radical that is the uh, abandoning of this notion of individuality, hmm. you know? Because when you know that you are, that your life depends on the life of earth and on the life of others, then the ethical call is to say, I need to go into forms of communal uh, relation with Earth and with others, right? So I think the, the other side of this coin is what we have been calling the ethical question. That is, uh, that is a question to the way in which we live here in the West. Uh, and well, also the Nords in the South let's say, in the consumer, in the global consumer society. And the ethical question says, can we live an ethical life in a world in which our well-being and our sense of self is dependent on the destruction of Earth and on the exploitation of the life of others? So when you go to the supermarket, right, what are we doing when we go to the supermarket? We are benefiting from the extraction of life from the earth and from the life of others, right? So you can have here in the Netherlands for one euro a piece of chocolate, but you are not confronting the ethical question. So what's happening with the rainforests, with the habitat of the animals, and what's happening with the kids that are working for that chocolate, right? So you are extracting the life of others and extracting the life of earth for your instant enjoyment through consumption. And that's one of the big uh, difficulties, right? Where we don't see the ethical implications of, or we don't want to see mm. the ethical implications of how we live and how our joy, our, I have to say, instantaneous joy and our desire driven by consumerism that is just something ephemeral and momentaneous is connected to deep suffering that doesn't go away with what we will call the colonial wound. Because once you destroy habitats, once you destroy the life of others, for you to have that chocolate, their lives and the habitat is damaged for a very long time, if not leading towards extinction, right? But Rolando, you're, you're, you're now basically tying this into our, our, I'm not allowed to say individual anymore, but our, our personal lives. Mm -hmm. And the choices that we make as consumers as well, it's all tied into decoloniality. Um, can you give some kind of practical example of, of, of how to then live your life if you want to <laughs> <laughs> well, do it right? You know, one of the, I don't know if it's very practical. Do but, you stop buying chocolate? But, or? No, but one of the things is, um, is to, as we see it, is at least to stop this pretension of innocence. Like I'm a good person in the world and I'm saving the world and I have nothing to do with the pain in the world or with the suffering in the world. I donate some money, right? right. This is what needs first to stop, to recognize, this is the call of decolonial feminism, to recognize that we are all implicated, right? that you are crossed by the colonial difference, that you are benefiting by that. And that doesn't mean you are a bad person, but it means you are historically situated in these relations of power and you're benefiting from them. And so how, so the way I put it uh, with my students is that it is a moment of uh, overcoming that 
ignorant innocence. You know, where you don't want to know about coloniality. You don't want to know about the suffering on the other side of the world. And you portray yourself as a good person, as a savior, mm -hmm. right? But when you recognize all our clothes, all our electronics are implicated in that history. And, and my well-being is implicated in the suffering of others. Then I may have a more truthful life. Mm -hmm. It's a life with tensions, right? But, but, uh, but with the awareness that you are in a world where you are implicated. And, and for me, that is the moment where you can take responsibility. If you live in the fiction that you are just good for the world and that the problems are somewhere else, uh, you cannot take responsibility, right? But if you position yourself and you say, well, I benefit from masculinity, for example, well, what does that mean? Which decisions I will take with that? Right, so, so for me, this is the moment of, I mean, I see it in my students that um, it is a very hard process when, when you go through this process of awareness, but at the same time it's very liberating because you are liberated from the anxiety that I think social media produces of producing an image of yourself that is all good and joyful and that is a fiction, mm -hmm. right? And suddenly realizing who you really are in the world. But it's not a very nice story because you are implicated in all sorts of things that you might not want to be implicated. But then you can take responsibility, right? And that might not be saving the world or becoming, uh, going to the mountain and becoming a saint, but that might be living with contradictions, but doing the best you can, right? Right. right. Okay, I think I can do that. <laughs> Uh, Ron, I'm going to ask my co-host Annalyn to come up here and see if she has any good questions to ask you as well. Thank you. It's very interesting. Um, yeah, I have a lot of questions in mind. Um, but. Uh, you mentioned a few times that you talk with your students about um, yeah, the questions of who, what, and how. Mm. Can you um, give an example of what you do in a lecture with your students? Like what, what assignments do you give? Or is your lecture different than most of the students have normally on universities in the Netherlands? Yeah, I think it is very... It is very different, and it has to do with these pedagogies I was speaking about. And uh, so first, I always ask my students to position themselves. And I give them tools. I tell them what, how the world is divided along the lines of race, gender, class, disability, uh, age, uh, cultures, there are other lines, but I put the main lines and then I tell them, well, you cannot be everywhere. You are somewhere. You cannot be in all these sides and you cannot also not be nowhere, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> like if you can be above the world <laughs> and be nowhere, right? You are somewhere there and the people you are reading are somewhere there. And I want you to become conscious of where are you situated? This is kind of a first exercise of positioning. And when they write, I ask them to position themselves. I don't want them to write as if they are nowhere or anywhere. I want them to write from their position, right? And, and I think that is an exercise that at first they don't really understand because they have always been taught that to be objective is to be nowhere and not to show in whatever they do to be an abstract author. And so it takes them a very long time to get into the point of recognizing that once they are there, their knowledge is much more truthful and they are not pretending to be everywhere, you know? And that this knowledge that pretends to be everywhere and anywhere is false in, the, in its pretension. It might be truthful in the things it uh, it does at some points, 
but in its pretension of universality or of total objectivity, there is something that is not uh, clear, right? Mm -hmm. Or not, uh, that is wrong <laughs> in, in that sense. Indeed. That is not truthful. Yeah. So yeah. we, I think this, uh, I mean, this comes from feminist philosophies, Donna Haraway, how do we move towards a more truthful knowledge? And for us, a truthful knowledge is a knowledge that recognizes situatedness. Do you think this is also missing in science? In the, if you read research articles, I never see like that someone is positioning mm -hmm. themselves first. Or do you think that's not something that needs to be? I think it is. Uh, it is missing in science. I mean, very strongly in the history of science, uh, from mathematics to medicine is crossed by race and gender, mm -hmm. right? And, and those historical conditions have produced a science that is uh, one-sided, let's call it like that, that is produced by, by the people that were privileged through race and gender. And that is, uh, that is something I think we need to recognize and uh, and I'm sure that uh, science, it is actually changing. There is important calls for diversity in sciences. And um, that once you begin including, because there is very important science that was not included in the canons because they were caught by race and gender, mm -hmm. not because it was not good knowledge, <laughs> right? So first, including that part in the canon is very important. And secondly, when you diversify the classroom, diversify the lab, you will have a different science, right? Yeah. So, for example, in medicine, it's very concrete why uh, the model of the body and illnesses has just been focused on, let's say, the white, western male. When many other people in the world face other type of uh, illnesses or conditions, right? So that's for, uh, a very concrete example. But also... In science, of course, for this historical subject, a science useful for extraction was very important because that's the power that it generated mm -hmm. and it had a connection to that power. What would, what would have happened if those resources would have been used to develop, let's say, indigenous sciences, right? Mm -hmm. For the preservation of Earth. And then uh, we would have a completely different world, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's not a it's not an anti science. It is a for a plural science, you know, position. Yeah, and um, to also put it more practical for students and teachers, um, what do you think students can do right now if they are about decolonization and they want to practice it more, put it more in practice on the university? Because I can imagine that a lot of teachers also doesn't know about this topic or what to do mm -hmm. in the lectures. Well, for me, it's very clear that the students are the force behind. The students are asking the questions. Yeah. Are asking why is my curriculum white? You know, are bringing literature, are organizing reading groups of things that are not read in the canon. <laughs> you know, and this is and they are doing research. Their master thesis, their PhD thesis is including all this that was excluded from their classroom. Mm -hmm. So I, I do see a very big transformation coming through the awareness of the students. And, and slowly, slowly, the teachers are catching up. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they are already doing a, a lot and, um, because it, it becomes me immediately meaningful for them. I think that is one of the beauties of decoloniality, that because it is not an ideology of this against that, when students recognize it, they they take it on because they see that it has important questions that they also have. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So we carry to the second segment. We have thirty minutes left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry for the interruption, but in terms of time, I think uh, we're going to conclude part one, mm -hmm. your first lecture. And uh, for the people at home watching this, I would say stay tuned. Part two is coming up. Okay.